so when was the last time you voided? Okay. Um, so we really want to see how much is that correlating with the distension of the bladder. Um, changing in urination patterns, yeah, it's an okay question. But really we're looking at how full did the bladder get in what length of time. Okay. Nice job, Ryan. Stay on top there, Xavier. I can know you can do it. The nurse would expect the least formed stool to be in which portion of the digestive tract? Least formed stool. stool. Most of you either read that or you were thinking about, we kind of covered this a little bit when we did nutrition. So nice job. Good job, everybody. Oh, it's almost a tie. The nurse asks if a patient needs to have a bowel movement 30 minutes after eating. Because of what? Why? <laughs> okay, so when you start to chew, which is what mastication is called, it's the signal for the gut to begin that peristalsis in the bowel. So it's kind of involuntary, partly brain, partly um, organ initiated. Woo, new person on top. Nice job, Erin. Pom pom coming up. The nurse educates patients about constipation after using laxatives because here she knows what. So one of the ways that you can think about this is it's kind of like um, when we think about function, use it or lose it. So if you have a patient who was rolling around in a wheelchair but was able to actually walk, they would become deconditioned, right? So we're kind of that use it or lose it kind of thing. So laxatives, which help you go to the bathroom, help you have a bowel movement, if you use them all the time and you are capable of having a bowel movement on your own, the bowel just becomes less responsive. Okay, so kind of think about that in a use it or lose it kind of way. Oh, this little, uh, wow, I'm having trouble driving over there. Come on, here we go. Woo, nice, new leader. The nurse gives a cathartic to a patient. The nurse knows it is effective when the patient does what? A cathartic. <laughs> Okay, nice job. So again, it's a definition. So a, a cathartic is a type of laxative, and so the patient will have a bowel movement. Also, if you're thinking about what class we're doing here today, that would have been super like, super guess. Awesome. So, here we go. Woo, nice. Pom Pom, Nick, Stacy, good job. Which of the following works best to prevent the spread of C. diff? <laughs> Super. So remember just proper hand hygiene techniques, which applies to a lot of transmitted infections or diseases. Nice. Good job, guys. Last one. Which of the following is the primary reason for Clostridium difficile infection? So there's more than one answer. Think about what's the primary reason for infection. Okay, so when we talk 
about the other one, which was contact with C. diff. The difference there is if a person comes in contact with their own bacteria, right, it may not cause infection, right? We know that um, because their own flora they're used to. Um, so really, the infection rate that we see in hospitals is primarily because of the overuse of antibiotics, okay? Um, so contact uh, will cause spread or contamination. And honestly, we would never get quite probably that tight on a test without better um, stuff up top. But just wanted you to kind of see the difference there. All right, everybody can go ahead and get into um, their PowerPoints. I'll get into mine. So, my what I love is reading stuff here. Is this somebody else's? Not mine. Somebody not sign out. Great, so now I have to start over. Super. Don, while, Dawn, while you're setting up the um, uh, PowerPoint, can I just add one thing? Oh, please do. So for many, we know about the foam, we know about the stuff that we spray on our hands, and that's good for many things. Is that enough for C. diff? No. We so have what, to wash our hands. And yeah. So remember, when it says proper hand hygiene, that can mean different things for different bugs. And for C. diff, it always means uh, definitely hand washing. Okay, let me find my own stuff here. Hello, so it'd be easy to find, and it may be there, but I'm having trouble threading it out, so I'll find it this way. some applications so hopefully most of you went through the student PowerPoint because now what we're going to do is actually apply it to two different conditions or diseases um, one of them is basically um, a short-term problem hopefully and the other one is a chronic disease so let's start with this one All right, so we're going to start with inflammatory bowel disease, okay? Um, now this is not, you know, as bad as, um, well, I take that back. We're just going to start here. Okay, what's the description of inflammatory bowel disease? So it's characterized by chronic reoccurring inflammation of the intestinal tract. So kind of your key words are chronic and reoccurrent, okay? Um, so there may be periods of remission. Um, exacerbation is when it starts up again, okay? Um, the exact cause is unknown, okay? There is no cure. It can occur at any age. The peak onsets are generally between 15 and 25, so younger people. However, older people, sometimes it goes undiagnosed for a while because they haven't really had um, a bad occurrence um, or many <coughs> occurrences so they don't seek treatment or diagnosis. Um, there is another second peak, we don't really know why, but it's in the sixth decade. So patients in, the, in their 60s, there's another peak of when people develop this. Um, both uh, sexes are equally affected. So, 
And I know you guys have blanks to fill in, so if I go too fast, please let me know. Um, I'm trying to maintain my um, a slower pace than my usual. Get on it. Um, an autoimmune disease, so it's the body attacking itself. It involves the immune reaction, okay? It's attacking the actual intestinal tract. Um, some agent or combination of agents kind of triggers an overactive, inappropriate response by the immune, immune system. And really, we're not really sure what that is. It could be a virus. It could be, honestly, a toxin. It could be, we're just really not sure. But something kind of makes the immune system go wild. Okay? Um, it does result in widespread inflammation and tissue destruction, but it does uh, stay in the intestinal tract. It involves a combination of things. So again, the environmental. Um, there is a genetic predisposition, but not everybody who has that in their family will get it. Um, but it does make them more at risk. And so if they do have an insult of whatever kind, um, they may their body may react um, that way. Um, so when we think about environmental factors, sometimes we can think about diet. <coughs> Uh, hygiene practices, maybe they pick something up because their hygiene practices aren't as good. Stress is a huge factor in a lot of immune responses um, and inappropriate immune responses. And there are a lot of hormones um, that work uh, in con uh, conjunction with stress. Um, so stress does cause uh, insult on the body in many different ways, and we're not sure that that doesn't um, also uh, affect IBD. Smoking, we know, um, does, as it does all of the body. Um, there are nicotine receptors in every single cell in the body, okay? And so that's why sometimes it's very, well, not sometimes it's very addictive, it's always addictive, um, but many times it's very hard to quit because of that reaction in every part of the body is getting some kind of reaction from this drug that we know as um, nicotine, okay? Um, and the use of the NSAIDs can be really, really hard on the digestive tract, so we think that that also plays a role. So now we're going to think about what does that mean to a nurse. Um, so when we have autoimmune disorders, we can have an increase in infections as well. We want to find out <clears throat> from the patient when we're assessing them Tell me what kinds of infections you've had. What does your past medical history look like? Um, whenever you have an infection, you know, maybe there's a correlation um, between something that happens in the gut, or maybe they're all gut infections, okay? Now, this one factor doesn't really mean a whole lot uh, on its own, but as we start to investigate, if we get more subjective and objective information, that makes sense and fits together, this might be something that we want to think about, particularly in a patient that's not already diagnosed, okay? Uh, use of prescribed OTCs, again, thinking about NSAIDs. There are other medications also that cause insult, but we're not going to go into those at this time. Family history. So it's good to always take a really thorough ham, uh, family history, regardless of whether uh, they're coming in with intestinal problems or any kind of problem, okay? Um, because what we know is that there are many different kinds of diseases and syndromes that are caused by um, genetic factors, okay? So it's really good to have a grasp and have that charted in the patient's EHR so that when pro uh, providers look at that, um, they can kind of, again, it's another really good piece of information, okay? Um, so diarrhea, if the patient is experiencing diarrhea, which is one of the um, signs, however, not all diarrhea, obviously, is IBD. One of the things that does make a difference is the presence of blood. So that is not normal, okay? However, it's not um, in and of itself, again, a diagnosis of IBD, okay? There are other infections, um, even parasitic infections that you might pick up at the cabin, I hate to tell you guys that, um, that can cause uh, blood in the stool. Um, if you get a really um, good bout of different kinds of uh, food poisoning, 
you can have not a lot, but you can have a presence of diarrhea. And also, some people mistake um, blood in the diarrhea for hemorrhoids, or so it's a very close vein that's very close to the anus, and it gets very irritated, and so it will bleed, and obviously it goes in the toilet at the same time. So we really need to figure out, is it actually the diarrhea? Is it coming from up in the intestines? Or is it coming from a, he a hemorrhoid, which would be totally different? Any questions? Okay, weight loss. So a sudden and progressive weight loss. Um, patients who have IBD usually do experience an unintentional weight loss. They're not trying to lose weight. They simply cannot keep that weight on, okay? And remember when we talked about nutrition last week, this is why each, each thing that we present, try to think about it in terms of overall what we've presented from the very beginning, okay? So nutrition plays a big thing in here. We learned that a greater than five uh, pound weight loss, you know, in a certain amount of time is really bad. It can cause malnutrition, right? And so we really need to investigate what is happening here. If this patient isn't trying to lose weight um, or who becomes really at risk of malnutrition, so they're not just underweight, but they're at risk for malnutrition, we really need to get in there and decide what is this. So get a diagnosis and provide some, um, the physician will provide some medical care, but nursing can also support that, okay? Anxiety and depression, so we've talked about how those play hand in hand. Sometimes the anxiety comes from all of the signs and symptoms, um, but depression is often a result of all of the things we've talked out about before. So that reoccurrent and sometimes unforgiving diarrhea, um, the inability to maintain body weight. Um, you can think if a person doesn't have enough nutrition, might, what, how, the, how might they feel day to day? Are they going to have a lot of energy? No. So they're going to become fatigued. If there's a massive amount of weight loss, we could look at anemia, which also can cause problems in other um, organs in the body and definitely signs and symptoms all over, shortness of breath, um, etc. So it really is kind of a devastating um, kind of disease. So when we think about how we are going to manage this, so for nursing, we're really going to think about diarrhea. What kinds of things can we do um, that will help this patient with diarrhea? Um, imbalanced nutrition. So again, we're thinking about nutrition and coping. Okay, And I hate the word kind of ineffective coping um, because it kind of relays that the patient is unable to for whatever reason. And honestly, sometimes this is so overwhelming that um, it's really, really difficult. It's not like their choice that they can't cope, okay? Um, even the coping mechanisms that they've used their whole life that might have been successful aren't necessarily successful in this kind of long-term chronic uh, kind of disease. So when we think about um, classification, um, we're going to think about manifestations. Um, it's classified as either ulcerative colitis, okay, which is an inflammation and tearing or ulceration of the colon and rectum. So it's a certain part of the uh, large bowel, okay, or Crohn's disease, which is an inflammation of any segment of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus, okay. So sometimes we can tell what we're dealing with, kind of the clinical manifestations give us an idea of whether we're looking at um, colitis or Crohn's, which kind of are treated the same because the underlying um, reason for it is still an immune response. Uh, however, there are certain things that um, do help us when we're looking at which one is it. Okay, so this is an example of what we might see if we have a patient who has bloody diarrhea, okay? So just blood in the stool with diarrhea isn't necessarily um, the same thing. But a patient who's experiencing it for the first time may not know. So we may have to ask questions like, um, tell me how it looks, okay? Um, which might seem kind of gross or kind of awkward, but we really are. Or if the patient brings in a sample or can produce a sample sometimes when they're in the office um, or in the hospital, sometimes that can really help us, okay? Um, you can see why this patient would be suffering from uh, weight loss, okay? 
Um, abdominal pain, so there is a significant amount of pain. When you say the word ulceration, and you think about an ulceration on the top of your skin, okay, and you can think about how painful that is, it's really eating away is that ulceration, whether it's in the stomach or whether it's in the lower part of the bowel. Um, so it does cause a lot of pain. Sometimes there will be a fever associated with, and again, that's attached to that immune response, okay? Fatigue may be a um, symptom of anemia, which we talked about with blood loss, okay? It can also come from weight loss or malnutrition, okay? So some of the complications, so again, hemorrhage. So we can't have them losing too much blood. Um, I, it's not a common occurrence for patients who have IBD um, to have to have blood transfusions. However, if it goes on long enough and it's severe enough, um, you know, we really need to take a look at some reference values um, for hemoglobin and hematocrit to make sure that they do have enough red blood cells to oxygenate the body properly. So strictures, um, which can turn into obstructions. So stricture is just like it sounds. It's a closing off, okay? And when that happens, we can get what we call a bowel obstruction, okay? And if that's not diagnosed right away, um, that can be life-threatening. So on the other hand, if we don't have a constriction, okay, we might have a perforation. So that ulceration just perforates into the abdomen. So we all know, and you guys know from micro, you guys have had micro already or you're in the middle of it? No. Okay, well you will learn um, in microbiology how much normal flora is in the gut, and there is a lot of it. So there are lots of bacteria, and they, um, if they're kept inside the GI tract, they actually perform really wonderful things. That's why we take probiotics and prebiotics and all the biotics, okay, is to keep the normal gut health. The problem is when all of those bacteria go into a place that should be um, sterile, okay, there are no bacteria, they have no reason to be there, you know, that is a raging infection. And again, that can be super life-threatening, okay? And that's what peritonitis is, okay? Fistulas, so that's when you actually develop a tunnel, um, and the tunnel you, uh, that things can pass through between two places, okay? So it could be between the small bowel and the large bowel, okay? It could be between two loops of the small, or excuse me, of the large bowel, okay? The other thing is if it's, it can also, um, develop fissures into other organs, let's say the um, bladder wall, different kinds of things, depending on how the, where the bacteria are and how bad it is. So fistulas are a really bad thing, okay? Super difficult inside the body to take care of that kind of infection, um, and sometimes they're actually never, um, they're never fully healed. Also, it can uh, happen that it, a fistula will occur from the large bowel to outside the bowel, and the patient will constantly be leaking infection outside the body. Um, so you can think about you know, what that does to your body image and those kinds of things, and you can see that depression might certainly be a part of that. Chronic dilatation, so toxic megacolon, um, can also occur, which is, again, not a, not a really good thing. Um, so again, high risk for colorectal cancer. So for whatever reason, okay, having this disease with the IBD, both um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, um, do put patients at high risk for colorectal cancer. So any tissues that are turning over very fast, so um, in this case, the lining of the GI tract, okay, is constantly being sloughed off and it comes out with the stool, okay? That's just the nature of the beast in a healthy person, okay? So when we have infections or ulceration, that, that uh, lining is being sloughed off, and if we're constantly turning over very fast those cells, there's an absolute possibility that we can develop different kinds of cancers, okay? 
So regular screening is super important. So as the nurse, that's one of the things that you really think about is are they up to date on their screening? You know how important that is. Some patients will give you the aha, blah, 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 blah. it's up to you to educate the patient on the risk of that. And if they happen to have either one of these kinds of IBD, um, the risk is very high. So you want to let them know the reason. It's not just that the CDC and other organizations have decided you should have a colon screening every so many years, yada, yada, yada. This is more for them, and they actually will be screened more often. Okay? We also have systemic complications. So that's one of the differences that you'll even see with arthritis, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or whether it's osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not an immune reaction, okay? So we don't see systematic complications like fever. We're going to talk about some of these in a second. When we start dealing with immune reactions, okay, then we have the opportunity for this to be systemic or go all over the body and affect other places in the body, all right? Kind of a bad thing, all right? So um, we can have joint complications. Eye uh, complications, mouth, kidney, bone, vascular, skin. Honestly, there's really no place that it, with a systemic complication, that it really couldn't um, erupt because the immune system is responsible for the entire body. There's no like places where it really doesn't affect. Um, and then um, the circulating cytokines that are released during immune reactions trigger inflammations. So that's a lot of times how it manifests in these systemic organs, like joints, kidney, bone, uh, even skin problems, is because of the inflammation. Okay? Um, and liver failure is one of those kind of um, really big systematic things. Uh, liver failure is very hard to treat, and again, the liver is responsible for detoxifying the entire body. It's also the shopping cart of all the proteins made in the body. So when proteins are broken down in the body, all the little pieces, like if you think about hema and globin, the hema goes to the liver, right? And the globin goes, and then the little things are put together. So it's a shopping cart where everything that's broken down in the body actually go to be put back together to be made into whatever proteins are necessary in the body. So the liver is like, I would say one of the, one of the things like right up there with the heart, the lungs, the kidney, and the liver. Super important, okay? Um, so we talked a little bit about the pattern of inflammation, so where it is and what it looks like. So the inflammation actually makes different kinds of patterns between Crohn's um, and colitis. And um, patients will suffer mild to severe acute uh, exacerbations um, that are unpredictable. And that's also another thing that um, keeps patients who have these diseases kind of always on the edge of their seat, no pun intended. Um, but you never know kind of when you're going to get that thing. So if it's really important for you to plan a honeymoon and you want to go to Hawaii and have this really good time, you're always going to be thinking about what if, right? What if this happens when I'm there? And not just that you might even have chronic diarrhea or bloody diarrhea, but you might actually have an exacerbation that's severe enough that you need to be hospitalized, okay? So it's, it's just really difficult to deal with. So here's just a, a kind of a picture of how Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis might manifest. So you can see that ulcerative colitis is kind of in that um, descending and anal part of the colon. And Crohn's disease is kind of all over the place. Okay? You good? Yeah. Not going too fast for anybody? Everybody in Rochester with me? All good? Okay, um, so inflammation involves all the layers of the bowel, so it's not just on the surface. We might just be able to see on the surface, unless there's a part of the colon that we take out and send to pathology. Um, but it's really damaging in that it incurs in more than the surface layer. And when I'm talking about the surface layer, I'm talking about the internal portion of the lumen, okay? 
Uh, skip lesions. So skip lesions, if we went back to that picture, it would be when we have um, damage in one area and then it has a nice piece of ball and then there's another piece that's attacked. So those are skip lesions and those are present between uh, diseased portions. So we can have a good portion that's working and then we can have all these skip lesions, which are really hard to take care of because how many colostomies can you have? Like you can't have, so they end up taking out very large portions if that ends up being what the treatment is um, because it's not like you can just take out a really small portion, okay? Ulcerations are deep and longitudinal and they penetrate between the islands or inflamed um, edematous mucosa. So edematous is edema, so it gets swollen and that's a result of the immune response as well, okay? So super damaging. Um, now a cobblestone appearance, as you'll see here in a second, um, is kind of, it really does just look like a cobblestone. So let's say they were doing, um, where they were going up with a scope and they were actually looking at the interior of the colon. They would actually see these portions um, that act in the picture will be coming up here in a second. So because inflammation goes through the entire wall, um, there can be microscopic leaks, okay? So again, it may not be full-blown nasty peritonitis, but even a little peritonitis is really a bad thing. Or it can form an abscess. And again, you guys are going to find out when you get to micro, it's much more difficult to deal with um, infections that are abscesses because we have to have bacteria that will actually penetrate the abscess. So the abscess has a wall that's surrounding the infection. The infection stays in the middle and it has this wall all the way around it. So we have to use drugs that are able to penetrate that to actually kill um, the bacteria, okay? So fistulas, we talked about um, adjacent areas, so large bowel to large bowel, bowel and bladder, bowel and vagina, bowel and outside of the body, very bad, very, very difficult to treat. I would say close to rarely completely resolved, okay? Uh, fistulas can form a tract. That's really what they are, not can form. They do form a tract through the skin to the, oh, the outside of the body there's saying, duh. Okay, so here's that picture I was talking about. So we have Crohn's disease and you can kind of see that cobblestone in the background and that's from those longitudinal um, kinds of uh, penetrations and then the norm normal colon has the horizontal ones. So if we have the longitudinal and the, and the horizontal, all of a sudden we have a real cobblestone-y kind of looking thing. So you can tell it looks incredibly different than colitis. So when they do look at the colon with a scope, um, you can kind of tell not just by where it's presenting, right, because you could have, remember, col uh, Crohn's in the um, descending colon as well, right? So, Because it can be anywhere. So unless it's like super textbook, um, you're not really going to be able to tell until you have some um, actual gross microscopic kinds of um, things available. So the ulcerations in ulcerative colitis are kind of smaller. They're like if you think about if you scraped your knee, uh, when you were riding your bike, okay? You might have a little cut, you might have a little abrasion, okay, but it really you don't have those longitudinal kinds of things. Um, you can have uh, um, wall destruction though, so the wall gets smaller, doesn't work as well. Um, but you can tell there's a huge difference. Maybe the patient is telling you things that work with both. Um, but this is one of the ways they'll use to actually diagnose which one it is. Any questions on those? So if you had a test question, okay, and we were asking you about one or the other, okay, and you were kind of thinking about which one might this be, think about these diagrams, okay? We're not really going to have test questions very, very specific to Crohn's um, and uh, to colitis. But remember that if you did your study guide, all that stuff is in your study guide about how you would ask and different kinds of things like that. So may have to do with it in a roundabout way. 
Um, so this is a fistula, what it would look like. And this is one to the outside of the body. So let's talk about Crohn's disease here. So common symptoms, diarrhea, crampy abdominal pain. And you know, crampy abdominal pain, when women are looking at that, we think, ah, oh, we're uncomfortable, you know. Could be that time. I mean, this is kind of debilitating, kind of crampy abdominal pain, okay? Um, it, it's kind of more severe than that, unless you have really severe pain. Um, so the patient is really, really uncomfortable, okay? And remember, we have to be careful what kind of medications that we give. Um, a lot of times opioids slow bowels down, different kinds of things like that. Um, normal uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are contraindicated. Um, so uh, weight loss is a little bit less when we think about Crohn's disease um, when the small intestine is involved. But when the large intestine is involved, or the stomach is involved, or the esophagus, we do see more weight loss. Um, rectal bleeding, less common, and you can think about that because the anus is actually involved in that descending colon, so that kind of makes sense, right? Um, and this one has a little bit less fever or other systemic symptoms. However, I would say looking at this slide, it would be it's not super clear. Like, again, you would need that scope to really tell. Um, nutritional problems, especially when the terminal ileum is involved. So when we think about the small bowel, and that's where we have most of the absorption that goes on in the body, obviously that would cause nutritional problems. Um, we also think of fat malabsorption, and uh, contrary to popular belief, we do need a, a, a good amount not a lot, but a good amount that's required um, for everything to work and function uh, in our body. Um, anemia can occur. Um, small intestinal cancer. So again, cancer risks are higher. So the pattern of inflammation for colitis, um, the mucosal layer of the colon and rectum. This is kind of weird in that when you think about it, it a lot of times starts in the rectum and then moves up towards the cecum, okay? Sometimes there's mild inflammation in the term terminal ileum. And so sometimes when Crohn's is just getting started, it's, it's so odd, you know, people aren't really you know, they've lost a little bit of weight. There's not a huge amount, especially with Crohn's, of blood involved. You know, a lot of times it's not so severe that they're seeking medical treatment until it gets really bad. Yep. Is this slide supposed to be Crohn's? Or because it says ulcerative colitis on the top? Ulcerative colitis. I was going back to talk about oh, okay. Crohn's. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because colitis, remember, starts in the rectum and is just in that descending. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Or uh, ulcerative colitis, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yeah. Colitis. Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Is everybody clear? Did I completely confuse everybody? Not, not what I say, but what I mean kind of thing. Um, there's mild inflammation in the terminal ileum, so sometimes um, it will back all the way up into the ileum, but not often. Diarrhea with a large fluid and electrolyte loss. So as you guys will find out as we go into fluid and electrolytes, um, this can be really, really dangerous, okay? Because electrolyte disturbances not only affect um, uh, certain, you know, body shifts and things, but it actually will cause the heart to malfunction, okay? And obviously we need the heart functioning properly. It can also uh, damage and uh, changes the function of the kidneys, okay? Um, breakdown of cells, so again, um, if we have a large amount of cells that are actually going down with the diarrhea and that are being sloughed off before they get broken down, we can be uh, losing a lot of protein. And we need to keep that protein in the body so that we can maintain um, the actual uh, fluid. That's how we maintain fluids within our body, um, is through the amount of protein in the body. And so this can be really tough. So all of a sudden, now we can have systemic problems with uh, swelling or edema, okay? 
areas of inflamed mucosa form pseudopolyps, so they're not really far enough out to really be or to really be a polyp, um, but they are pseudopolyps. And again, pseudopolyps, um, if there's enough of them, can really make the patient um, have an, even at a higher risk for cancer. Okay, so when the doctors are looking at and they go up with the scope and they're looking uh, inside the intestine, one of the things that they're looking for is the presence of polyps. But they're also looking for pseudopolyps because that can also mean that the patient is at risk. So it's not something they can actually slice off like a, like a real polyp and send to pathology, um, but they do look different and it is the, uh, meaning that there, there's changes that are happening. Okay. So common symptoms of ulcerative colitis, there, now I think I'm on my own track here, uh, are bloody diarrhea. So this one, there is more blood generally in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's. However, you know, it's very individualized as well, and the degree of the inflammation. Uh, sometimes patients can have as many as 20 um, bouts of diarrhea a day. So you can imagine that whatever food was present, obviously is moving through fast enough that they're not able to extract the nutrients. Um, but you can imagine that this does cause an ulceration, okay? And those places where it's scraping off and causing those ulcerations all along um, the large colon, okay? So really damaging. Um, Abdominal pain, again, very, very painful. Both of these uh, <coughs> problems. In severe forms of disease, that again, because of the immune system being involved, we can see a systemic fever. Whenever you see fever and inflammation, they kind of go hand in hand. So if you're ever trying to think about whether this is an uh, immune response, okay, um, you would see some type of fever generally, okay? Um, so that's one of the telltale signs that we're dealing with. Um, the immune system is the presence of a fever. Rapid weight loss, and honestly, you can see how would you maintain your body weight. Anemia, again, with large um, doses of blood being lost, anemia is a real problem. Um, and these patients may be really at risk for having to have blood transfusions, which can put them at risk for having other things. Tachycardia is one of the body's ways to compensate for anemia. So if you have a lack of oxygen around the body, right, the heart's going to beat faster because it thinks, oh my gosh, i got to get this blood into the lungs so that it can get some oxygen and get it out to the body. And in a very short-term disease, it's an effective uh, compensatory mechanism. Unfortunately, this is chronic and can last for a long time. So if we put that kind of stress on the heart, you can imagine that we could also have cardiac problems. Dehydration simply because of the amount of fluids that are lost. And it's not just the fluids, but when we talk about fluid and electrolytes, you're going to see how that dehydration plays with um, the electrolytes as well. So when we think about Okay, the goals of treatment. Obviously, cure isn't on the board, right? So we need to think about how can we get this ball to settle down. And when these patients come into the hospital, I mean, they are really sick because they've had this chronic problem their whole lives. If they can manage it at home, they do manage it at home. It's only when it gets so severe that they're unable to manage it at home that they end up in the hospital. Okay, so we're really looking at um, resting the bowels, so finding medications, finding um, different kinds of nutrition that rest the bowel. Control the uh, inflammation. So if we kind of get at the source, which we know that this is an immune problem, right? If we get at the source, we can help the bowel rest. We can kind of get the immune system uh, calmed down so it's not attacking as much. What do you think the problems are? of tamping down the inflammation. Yeah. You're really susceptible to getting sick, though. Yep. You're super uh, susceptible to other infections. Okay? So that that's a really bad thing. So we really have to think about how we're going to be cautious in the use of those kinds of things. Um, we need to correct malnutrition when we have patients who are 
not able to um, absorb different kinds of um, nutrition, alleviate stress. Now, when you think about having all of this going on and you're trying to alleviate a patient's stress, you go, wow, that's going to be super difficult, right? So sometimes this is where you really need to pull out your therapeutic communication, okay? Sometimes they need to go through a period of grieving and venting um, just to kind of get all that's been bottled up inside out. Um, and so really being a good listener can help alleviate some stress. Um, also, it's really good to have good conversations with your patients about what kinds of things cause them stress, right? So we think about certain family situations, okay? Some of them are more wonderful, some of them are more stressful. If we happen to know that this family causes a lot of stress for our patient, we might kind of uh, do something to alleviate that by, you know, making visiting times a little bit more um, tight and different kinds of things about that. So we're really trying to um, protect our patient from any kind of stress that we can. Obviously, we can't do it all. Relieve any symptoms that are going on, so that might come from replacement of electrolyte fluids. Um, it might come from just soothing salves on sores. I mean, different kinds of things. And basically improve the quality of life for this patient. Okay? Any questions about any of that? So when you think back to your study guide and you think about um, the whole uh, anatomy and physiology of the bowel, okay, or not just the bowel, the GI tract all the way from the mouth to the anus, you know, think about different diseases and how they would affect, right? When we think about nursing diagnoses, right? So what kinds of things are happening that would cause us to lean one way or another, okay? Um, because we're going to treat as nurses um, let's say, ineffective coping skills, way different than we're going to treat constipation, right? So we really need to find out what is the problem, right? And so we can do a really good family history, we can do really good signs and symptoms, and although some of you might think that this is all doctor stuff and it's just stuff you read in the history and physical, nurses actually accumulate a, raw, a lot of really good information because who spends the most amount of time listening. We do, right? And so we develop trust relationships so patients are very willing um, to share kind of intimate details where, you know, you're in and out of a doctor's office for 15 minutes and if you get 15 minutes when you're in the hospital, I mean usually they're in and out of there in less than that and the physicians are reading or asking the nurses a lot of questions, okay? So that's where we really need to do our job good or well. So. Um, it's important for nurses to do not just good physical assessments, but um, good psychosocial and those kinds of things. Especially when we think about diseases like this that cause so much strain on the patient. So what kind of diagnostic studies might you see in the EHR? Again, we just talked about history and physical examination. Huge. Blood studies. So a CBC is a complete blood count. And so here you're going to be able to see two major things. There's lots of little things. But you're going to be able to see white cell count, right? And if we have an elevated white blood cell count, we're really looking at infection. And the higher it goes without coming back down is indicative of the infection either not, um, uh, not getting better or getting worse, okay? Um, another part of the CBC is we're looking at neutrophils. And neutrophils are another thing that is very um, important when we're really looking at infection. Okay? Um, red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit all go together. And those will be indicative of anemia if they are all decreased. So if you think about that guide that I gave you last week, you'll find these things there. Serum protein levels, again, hugely important. If you're having 20 stools a day, obviously you're flushing a lot of those proteins down the toilet. Those proteins actually need to be broke down and sent back to the liver, where we have that nice little shopping store so that all the proteins of the body can be made. And we'll talk about more of that when we talk about fluid and electrolytes too. But you saw the, the main reason we have albumin, as you read last week. So it's hugely important in the function of all things going on in the body. Stool cultures, so you will see those. Um, they're trying to rule out the presence of any kinds of bacteria that could be causing some of the same symptoms. Okay, 
And so C. difficile might be one of them. Salmonella might be another one of them. So there also could be parasitic infections that could cause some of the same symptoms. Um, so things that are commonly found in IBD are pus, which is basically um, kind of the infection, okay, uh, blood, and mucus. Okay, so the mucous membrane is all being attacked and sloughed off. Uh, blood is coming from where there are those ulcerations, um, and the infection is that uh, uh, drainage. Okay, yeah, imaging studies that are commonly seen, oops, let's go back. Co uh, imaging studies, um, you might find um, like uh, colonoscopy, where they go in and they look with that scope and that light and look <coughs> around. Um, you might also see either CAT scans or MRIs where they're looking at specific portions of the bowel to see how damaged they are, um, where all in the GI tract is being attacked. And then when we talk about therapy, um, so sometimes antimicrobials are actually needed. And again, so they're doing cultures, okay? Stool cultures to weed out anything that could cause similar things. We're also looking at different kinds of cultures um, that if, if we have some fistulas or some perforation, we're looking at what actually got into the perineum, okay? Um, and so we need to find out what antimicrobials are going to attack and kill things where they don't belong. The problem is with most um, antibiotics, they work very systemically, okay? So not only do you kill the bacteria where it shouldn't be, right? You kill the bacteria where it should be. So we need to be very good stewards of microbials, okay? So um, we used to call it the gunshot method when we would have physicians just, you know, hang five or six different kinds of antibiotics or they would hang such, and when I say hang, usually they're IV, so they're more potent, more powerful, they get into the body quicker. Um, or they would hang such broad spectrum antibiotics that it wasn't just killing a certain kind of flora, it would just wipe the body out. And like I said, that puts the body at increased risk for lots of other things. So sometimes you just create uh, something even worse. Steroids, which are what works on the uh, inflammatory response, um, also can cause very bad um, kinds of side effects, okay? So blood sugars can go up and down. Um, we, you've heard of roid, roid raging, right? So people get can get very angry and very tense, and when you're trying to deal with stress, you know, that's not a really good kind of thing either. Also, people don't sleep when they're on steroids. Again, you're trying to decrease the stress, right? So if you haven't slept for three days, how much stress are you really... So you have to think about with every kind of treatment, particularly if it's a, a, a pill or a, a, that kind of thing, you know, there's kind of a side effect that we need to really be thinking about. So we go up one and we might have to come down two. Um, it is helpful for acute flare-ups, but it's not without its own challenges, okay? Diseases occur when the patient's own immune system attacks the body, okay? That's the most important thing for you to remember. Um, and I would also remember that steroids suppress the immune system. Um, that's kind of a basic kind of thought. Um, but as you progress in this class and your other classes, it'll be important for you to have that foundation. So what do we do nutritionally for these folks? We do get dietary involved. So we're really looking at bolstering the proteins, usually, okay? We're also trying to bolster the number of calories, okay? Uh, goals of dietary management are to provide adequate nutrition without causing exacerbation. So in other words, we know that sometimes nutrition in and of itself can irritate the gut, right? So we don't want to exacerbate anything. Correct and prevent malnutrition. So we, when we think about um, registered dietitians and we wonder what they do and how important they are, could you imagine now after just having one one course and one class on nutrition and nursing, how important their job really is and how much they really have to know to kind of correct these things. They're always an uh, interdisciplinary uh, team that you want to reach out to. Um, in many hospitals, um, nurses can actually put in orders for nutritional consults or 
they can ask the physician at any point if they have um, good rationale of why it should happen, um, and you can talk that over with your doctor. But it's something we monitor. Nurses monitor weight. We monitor their nutritional status by physical and other means. And so we know when, and we provide that information for the physicians, okay? Replace fluid and electrolyte losses. So our physician may be ordering certain fluids based on um, the laboratory studies and the patient's symptoms. We actually are going to be the ones that are going to um, maintain the IV and to actually um, put those things in the patient's body. It's very important for us to know how to manage those, and we'll talk about those again when we talk about uh, fluid and electrolytes. Prevent weight loss. There are decreased, decreased oral intake. If you know that every single thing that you eat or drink is going to come right out within you know, a half an hour and you've been bleeding and you're tired and all of those kinds of things, would you really want to eat? So all we have, we have this mind over matter kind of thing. Again, we have blood loss and malabsorption of nutrients. Um, and that will depend more on the location of the inflammation. Again, if it's in the uh, small bowel, we're going to have a lot of problems. But if they simply can't eat and keep things in there long enough, um, to actually break it down, we're still going to have malnutrition. So during those acute acerbations, when we see these patients in the hospital, um, regular diets are rarely okay, tolerated. Um, sometimes we need enteral feedings. Okay? Um, we can manage them better. We can pick and choose what we have in them so that we are less likely to cause uh, more damage or exacerbation. You guys learned all about enteral feedings last week. So you should be able to put these two concepts kind of together. High calories and nutrients without other things that would cause problems in the gut. It's lactose free. Even people who don't have a lactose intolerance, okay, let's say diagnosed, lactose can be very difficult to digest anyway. And so um, we really prefer that. Easily absorbed. Again, those enteral feedings are meant to be easily absorbed. Um, then when they come off those enteral feedings, then foods that they know from a history are not likely to <coughs> cause exacerbation. And we know from research <coughs> are not likely to cause an exacerbation are gradually introduced. So foods that trigger uh, exacerbations vary. So that's why it's really important for you to do a really good history with your patient. Um, sometimes food diaries really help identify problems. And that would especially be true for someone who was newly diagnosed, maybe even for a first or second trip to the hospital. They're really not sure. Um, people who've been in and out of the hospital for years and years have a really good idea about what's causing problems or what will cause them problems. These are some of the um, dietary things that are known to cause problems. And obviously smoking, again, should be avoided. Surgical therapy for Crohn's um, is oftentimes happens. Um, and sometimes uh, if they have complications that keep reoccurring, or if it's something, um, I think Rainy was the one that um, talk to you guys a little bit about, I can't remember where when we were talking about this, but uh, sometimes when we do um, uh, colostomies, we're really looking for it to be a short-term kind of thing, and then we want to put the bowel back together and get rid of that colostomy, okay? So that would be the goal, uh, if at all possible, is to have a, a short-term, maybe where they take out a piece of colon, um, but they take a small enough piece that they can put it back together um, and then actually uh, have a functioning bowel. Um, a lot of times they do that for strictures or obstructions or a place where you might have a perforation. Unfortunately, for the majority of patients with severe Crohn's, uh, we do see that they require surgery. Now, it could be minor, moderate, or it could be very severe surgery, okay? So I don't want you to think everybody has to have their ball up because that's certainly not true. Um, and everybody who has Crohn's has colostomy. That's not true either. Very individualized. These things depend on the immune response, how compliant they are, even knowing their own tolerance of foods, different kinds of things. 
how well managed their stress and sleep are. I mean, it's very individualized. Um, that surgery, surgery obviously causes a remission for a certain period of time. Unfortunately, recurrence is really high, okay? Um, <coughs> so post-operative care for this kind of patient, if they have an ileostomy, remember that's where the, um, the most fluid stool will be found. So we can have as much as 1,500 to 2,000 mils per 24 hours. Now to put that into context, the average or uh, amount for a, an adult hydration to keep them well hydrated is about 2,000 mils, okay? So if they're putting out 2,000 mils, we almost have to double or triple that for them to maintain hydrated, okay? So um, it can be a real problem. Not only that, but we need to maintain good care of that ileostomy, particularly in the first couple days. And so we might be changing it really often. What we don't want to happen is for that ostomy to actually become really dirty or leak all over the patient, not just because it's disgusting and it's obviously smelly and it makes them feel very bad and all of those kinds of things, but it's actually hugely um, corrosive on the skin. So then we can have skin issues, okay? <coughs> Um, things we want to watch for is hemorrhage, any kind of abscesses that form after that surgery. Unfortunately, we're not all done with obstructions, even if it was done for an obstruction. Again, those strictures can occur anywhere, um, and so we can just end up with another one. So if, for instance, the patient is, um, like we have stuff coming out the ostomy, obviously, because it's in the first part, but if the patient keeps having a lot of nausea and throwing up vomiting, so nothing can go through the, through the GI tract to the bowel, right, or even out the ileostomy, it's going to come out the other way. We need to think if it's all coming out this way or through the ostomy, we may have another obstruction. And they are very painful. Um, and again, these patients can't really um, stand that extra piece. So um, this is just where an ileostomy would be found. So we're really looking at that small bowel. This is a good example on the bottom of what a really good stoma looks like. So they're nice and beefy and red. They should be red. That means that there's good blood flow. If it was really pink or dull looking, then we would be really worried that there wasn't enough blood flow in that stoma and it actually was dying, okay? So we really want a beefy, red, shiny, fabulous, okay? After they heal, those are that particular skin, does, it's not painful or anything like that. What is painful, though, is if there's leaking around it and we start to damage skin around it, okay? So nursing management, decrease the number and severity of acute exacerbations, maintain fluid balance, help the patient remain um, pain-free or not really pain-free, I doubt that's going to happen. Uh, have a um, level of pain that's acceptable, I like that. Um, compliance with medical regimen. Again, sometimes these medications cause side effects that are not, not nice, okay? So sometimes compliance can be a real issue. Um, nutritional balance, again, that really is going to start to happen um, when we can see if it's going to be long-lasting, when we're done with the enteral feedings, or they might have to go home and continue enteral feedings, okay? Um, so nutritional balance, and we saw what our laboratory numbers look like. We know what they would look like physically, right? So we're looking at fingernails, we're looking at skin, all of those kinds of things to determine that. And basically, just have an improved quality of life. It's never going to be perfect, but we really do want to improve it. Uh, during acute phases, we're really going to look at uh, helping the patient remain hemodynamically stable. So those are big words. Basically, that means that they're not going to hemorrhage, um, that their anemia is going to start to resolve, and we um, don't have any even internal bleeding, external bleeding. Pain control. This is kind of just redundant. Establish a rapport with patients. Like I said, a lot of times they really need to vent. They really need to be able. So um, it's going to be all right. Uh, everything's going to be all right. Isn't kind of the responses that you want to have, you know, kind of patronizing things. 
um, you really want to use therapeutic communication with these folks, okay? Um, assist them, accept the chronicity of IBD, help them realize they do have the power to manage this disease to a, disease to a certain extent, extent by practicing self-care, okay? Um, to help to learn strategies to cope. Teaching, obviously, if you are a nurse and you're not teaching, this is a very bad thing. All nurses teach. You need to be able to relay to the patient how important it is to rest and to maintain dietary management. So if all you do is get them patched up in the hospital and they leave and then they automatically come back, that's going to be a really bad thing. Perinatal care, can you imagine having diarrhea 20 times a day, how raw you would be down there? Okay. Um, there are different kinds of products that, that um, either are, um, you can get a script for or that are over the counter that help with cleaning um, and help deal with things like the development of uh, hemorrhoids, those kinds of things, but it's hugely important to keep that area clean. Um, it will help with pain. Uh, the action and side effects of drugs, we've kind of been talking about that. Symptoms of recurrence, when to seek medical care, and diversional activities. Manage fatigue, skin integrity, these are all nursing things. And these are the big stuff. I mean, the doctor is writing the script and he's managing that patient up here, but your day-to-day -day care is hugely important. Deal with order issues. Again, you're helping the patient accept something that's going to happen forever. Again, there are products that can help eliminate odor. Um, so maybe you just need to get them hooked up with a walk nurse. Anybody know what a walk nurse is? So a walk nurse is a nurse that has advanced training um, and education in wound ostomy care and continence, wound ostomy and continence. So those are their primary specialties. And these kind of patients um, have problems with um, continence of bowel, right? They obviously, some of them can have ostomy. Um, and a lot of them will have wound care if it's surgical or if there's fistulas, that kind of stuff. So again, an interdisciplinary person that you might want to get into the mix is a wound ostomy care nurse. And they have tricks in their bag, you wouldn't believe. That is their specialty. They deal with it day in and day out. So they can help these patients get the right kind of supplies and really be your advocates. And you can learn enormous. I have all of my students when the walk nurses come follow that walk nurse with as many patients as they can during the own care of their own patient because the stuff they tell you and that you learn, I could never teach you because they have just so many that they've taken care of. Um, achieve short-term goals and realistic long-term goals. Um, decrease the number of schools. All this stuff is going to be really coming from those things that you're providing. Um, I would say gerontologically, you just need to remember that there is, again, that peak of people who've never been diagnosed with IBD suddenly coming up with this disease. Um, diagnosis is often difficult because of that. It's a second peak. A lot of times, um, doctors don't really look very closely into this because they have some assumptions that, you know, it's diff, it's this, it's that, and we're, we're not... Um, as uh, vigilant about really the difference between that 15 and 25 year old getting diagnosed and our 60 year olds. Um, NSAIDs are overused by older adults, so we have to really be careful. A lot of them don't even talk about it um, in their um, uh, medication history, although they could be eating, who knows, 15, 20 pills a day. Okay, so be sure that you ask about that. They're at greater risk of these complications of steroid, surgical mobility, um, and volume depletion. And that is it. So you may take a 15 minute break. We'll see you back here at three. Any questions before you go? Yes, go hang on one second, everybody. Who's live? Huh? Can you go back one or two? I can't. So everybody stay seated just for a second. Tell me when. I just need to copy this down. This one? Okay, can you go to the next one, actually? Yep. That one? That one. That one. That one. That one. That one. Okay. Any other questions before we break? Anybody from Rochester? Okay. 
the last slide. Just okay, hang on two seconds. Did you get it all? Yes? That was the last slide? Is there more? No, the one before. That's okay. That one? That it? Yeah. Okay. So for those of you who still need to do um, re uh, exam review, you can get your stuff here. They're posted outside the doors. Make sure they don't disappear. And they need to have every one of these back in case you weren't here earlier. Okay? So these that have a copy of what you missed are up here. And you can use them to look at the keys outside the room. You cannot take the key and you cannot take this paper home. If they disappear, we can only assume that that's getting spread all over and therefore that test is invalid and you will get another test. Nobody wants that. Okay? Make sure I get all of these back. You can put them up here. And if you want to use them to review your test results, you can do it out there.
Okay, just another minute or so. So if you're not back in the room or starting to settle down or bringing up the next PowerPoint, that would be a good thing to do. So I have removed the exam key from Twin Cities. I will not be here after class. I need to like boogie out of here at at least 425. I have an engagement that I can't like be late for. So if you have questions, be it Rochester or the Twin Cities, rather than bombarding us at the end of the class, um, this is what Rainy and I would like for you to do. Uh, uh, send us an email and um, have both of our names on it so that we can, there's some of his content, some of my content, okay? Write your question. If you are challenging an answer, you must provide a rationale, okay? That means you need to go back through any slides that we've provided you with or material. It can be the study guide that I provide. It can be the voice threads, anything we've provided you in class, okay, or asked you to look at as a reference, you provide the rationale and you can challenge an answer, okay? But to just say, I think this is the other answer, can you explain why it's not? And we go through, I mean, we might be able to explain why it's not, but to really challenge it, I think it should be. We really need for you guys to do the work because we've done the work already, okay? Um, and I think the process of finding what you think you thought you were thinking um, is also sometimes self-enlightening and not that Rainy and I can never ever be wrong because I was wrong once, I think Rainy might have been wrong twice. Yeah. <laughs> like sends you an email and you give them the point back? Will you give that point back to everybody? Yes. Okay. Yep. So, so I don't know in Rochester if you heard the question, but if there is a challenge on a question that we would happen to give the point back, we would give it to anyone who got that question wrong. I will tell you it's rare yeah. that we do because like I said, Rainy and I really have done the work beforehand. However, we've also been wrong, okay? So I don't want to say we never can be. So don't feel like you were unapproachable in this atmosphere. There's just a way that we would like for you to do it, if at all possible. I also want to make sure that everyone, both in Rochester and the Twin Cities, has returned their document that has their exam question questions on it that they got wrong. That is not for you to take home, okay? Um, and so we need all of those back, okay? Kind of what I told them here in Twin Cities is if we don't get the exams back or we don't get these back, then it kind of voids your test and you get to have another one. How bad would that be? Margaret? Um, just to clarify, we would never lose a point though if you... No, okay. no. We won't take a point away from you, okay? So, hopefully looking at the rationales, if you did get the question wrong, was helpful in that our final is cumulative. Nobody start to panic now. We haven't lost a single person. You don't see any, you know, headstones or anything around. There's no epitaphs out in the hallways or memorials to students we've killed, okay? So we will make sure, but um, it is good to remember cumulative because your patient, this is what we would normally call a fundamental course. So it's what you build all the rest of your nursing practice on. So it's not like you can't understand this stuff and build on it, or your foundation will be kind of weak, okay? So hopefully this, that little four-minute chat was helpful. Um, any questions now that you've thought about, okay? So really think about the principles um, that you learned in Potter and Perry in your readings, the voice thread, um, and the two PowerPoints that I'm presenting. Um, urinary tract infections, um, there may be some questions more specific to urinary tract infections, but it's because the questions in the urinary portion in the book kind of go into that. So there may be more of a, um, a lap, a lapse, or overlaps. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm really dry today. I don't know why. All righty. Without further ado, ado. How about we do it? 
Okay, so here we're going to talk about urinary tract infections. That is not to say that things like continence and the other things that were presented in Potter and Perry are not just as important. So make sure that you read those, okay? Um, the toilets I've used. So, yeah. So think about, you know, how people actually, um, you know, have, have continents all over the planet. It's all different, all over the place, okay? So that's especially important when you are thinking about privacy issues, when you're thinking about positioning issues. You know, our body works best in the way that we're used to making those certain actions, okay? So let's start off with an A, B, C, one, two, three. Get out your cards, let's go. It's always fun to have a quiz before the material. I think you guys will do just mighty fine, actually. I don't know. I don't see any smiles. Come on. Brandy, let's go. Ellie, smile. There you go. I can't see your little faces in Rochester. Otherwise, I'd pick you out, too. Okay. All right, here we go. So the UTI is the most common bacterial infection. Ah, see, women or men. I told you guys you were going to do super well. What? Come on. You know, I can't give you a big red car, but you are absolutely right in Rochester. Yes. At least 20% of women will develop a UTI during their lifetime, and several women will actually have reoccurring UTIs due to um, multiple problems we'll talk about. So here's kind of a pictorial of the, of the body. This particular body is the woman. And so you can see that the length between the urethra and the, uh, the uh, bladder and is the anus and the urethra is smaller than it would be in a gentleman, okay? And so that's kind of the reason. Also, just the way that our body kind of functions puts us at a little bit of a risk, okay? All right, so the bladder and its contents are free of bacteria in the majority of healthy persons. True? Yes. So there are a few people that have some colonizing bacteria in their bladder, and that's asymptomatic uh, bacteria. In other words, there's a few bacteria in there. They're not really causing a problem. They're not growing in, like, craziness. They're not multiplying in craziness. They're not causing a lot of symptoms. Um, and that's why we call it asymptomatic. Remember, um, when we think about um, uh, prefixes and suffixes, they're super important to figure out what the word actually means. And so when we put the word A in front of it, what does it mean? Anybody? Okay, over here. Without. without. Okay. So anytime you see A something or other, it means without. Okay. So asymptomatic, without uh, symptoms, okay? E. coli, or Escherichia coli, is the most common pathogen for urinary tract infections because that's what colonizes the gut, okay? There are a lot of other bacteria that colonize the gut as well, uh, but this is the primary one, okay? Um, so counts of 10 to the fifth or more indicate a significant UTI. So the reality is when we send urinary samples to the laboratory and they will grow them like you guys will when you get to micro, you're going to actually count colonies, okay? And so we're really looking for an abundance over and above what you would normally see. Oh, don't be doing anything naughty. Okay. Okay. Um, However, in some people, we will see small or lower counts um, with pa and patients who actually do have signs and symptoms. But most of the time, we're really looking for 10 to the fifth colonies of, of colony forming units is what they're called, CFUs, okay? Okay, another question. Which of the following patients are at risk for a UTI? What do you think? Immunosuppressed? Diabetic, kidney problems, multiple antibiotic courses, and have traveled to developing countries. This one is a little bit harder. 
you can you can actually hold up more than one card if you think it's more than one, or you can hold up E if you think it's all, or if you think that it's just one, then you can hold that one up. Okay, good, good, good. All right, good. Good, I see lots of different answers. Excellent in Rochester, super. Yes, A and D are both correct. However, the answer is E. Okay, so um, immunosuppressed patients, obviously, okay, are more at risk. Diabetic patients have an abundance of glucose, okay, that they're releasing into their urine. And glucose is just a fabulous thing for bacteria to grow in. They love it. Give them something to eat, give them a warm place to grow, and they go crazy. Okay? So um, diabetic patients are at risk. Kidney problems, so again, having gone on multiple antibiotic courses or have traveled to developing countries. Did I get that wrong? Um, did I confuse myself? No, it's all of them. You guys are confusing me with your looks. Um, yes, and having developed, gone to developing countries can also be because you're using different, uh, like the different toilets. So you're not used to being in a certain position or having toilet paper or not toilet paper, and so it's a different kind of thing. You're also introduced to different bacteria. The biggest risk factor, I would say, would be A. But um, having got, undergone multiple antibiotic courses is starting to be a close second. Um, e. coli used to be a bacteria that was easily killed, okay? And we have a special antibiotic Bactrim that we used to use all the time that worked primarily on E. coli, and it worked extremely well. And now there are increasing every year the um, cases of um, E. coli infections that are resistant to Bactrim and other antibiotics, Cipro, I mean even some of our bigger um, gun antibiotics. So um, it's starting to be kind of a, a hodgepodge. Okay, so classification of UTI, is it upper or lower? And it will matter, okay, so upper UTI um, are uh, typically um, symptomatic with fevers, chills, and flank pain. So that means the infection is likely way far up in the kidneys or the upper part of the ureters. Um, actually, it's um, more painful. Um, if you think about the kidney, it is encapsulated, right? So if I have this capsule and I have infection growing inside of it, where will it go? It can only push out, right, or start to go down the urethra, uh, ureters a little bit. So just even that pressure of pushing on the, on the nerve endings that are inside the capsule of the kidney are going to cause in, intense pain. If you've ever seen anybody with a kidney infection, anybody? Anybody had one? Seen anybody with one? Rochester? Increase, it's, it's very, very painful, okay? Um, and that's just because of where it's located and kind of some of those um, reasons that really have more to do with the anatomy um, of the kidney, okay? Uh, lower UTI tracts, uh, UTIs are, there's no systemic manifestations. In other words, um, you can have like pain and those kinds of things, but usually the pain is uh, with peeing or it's very low, it's not kind of systemic where it gets everywhere. Um, and so you can also have, um, so you can have pain on uh, urination, you can have pain right at the bladder. Um, you can start to have a fever if it's untreated, okay? So it's getting to the point where it is becoming more systemic. Um, but generally, people who have a lower urinary tract are getting it treated right away because they're uncomfortable, um, and so it doesn't usually end up going systemically. Um, we think about an upper urinary tract infection up in the renal uh, uh, parenchyma, 
And so I was talking to you about why. So it's a solid part of the kidney, um, and there's just really nowhere for it to go other than when it grows and it swells. Remember, we have that in, uh, inflammatory response. It just pushes against all the nerve endings in the capsule. The capsule doesn't move. It doesn't get bigger. It's not like a bladder. It's encapsulated, okay? Um, it can be in the ureters, although we see probably more stones in the ureters than we do um, infection unless it's actually coming down from the kidneys. An example would be pyelonephritis. So anybody know what the pyelo, what that suffix means? So white, white blood cells, that kind of thing. So uh, infection in the nephr uh, nephrons or up in the kidney. So it's inflammation of the renal parenchyma and collecting system. So you should kind of be able to figure out where it's at from the nephritis part. Lower urinary tract, again, usually no systemic manifestations. However, we can have manifestations at the site. Okay, so don't think that it's painless because it certainly is not. Um, example, cystitis inflammation of the bladder or uh, urethritis, which is inflammation of the ure uh, urethra. So you can see the difference between the upper tract and the lower tract. Urosepsis. So because the kidneys sit and filter out essentially all the blood in the body every minute, more times a minute than we can count, right? So the blood is going through there. If we actually have uh, infection in there, all of a sudden we can end up with sepsis, okay, going throughout the body caused by an infection um, in the urinary system, all right? This is very dangerous, okay, life-threatening, bad, sepsis, any kind of sepsis. But just remember a UTI that's not treated or a kidney infection that's not treated could definitely lead to urosepsis. So remember when we did um, aging, what was one of the things that we had for atypical presentations? Anybody remember? Confusion. Confusion was an atypical presentation, yes. What else? Did we have a spike in a fever? Not always, okay. Did they always feel a urinary tract infection? No, okay. So a lot of our older people, particularly older women, do not feel all that um, pain. I mean, if it was kidney, I would think they would, unless it was an advanced case of Alzheimer's or something like that. Um, but a simple urinary tract infection, they often do not feel. They don't spike a fever. Um, they're confused. They might fall. They might quit eating. So it's a little bit different. And what happens when it is untreated, okay, is when we end up with urosepsis. Okay, so it's super important to keep on track of those, particularly for our geriatric population. Um, so the urinary tract above the urethra is normally sterile. Okay, now what I want you to remember is that um, all of the mucous membrane that goes up the urethra surrounding the bladder and up to the kidneys is continuous. Okay. So especially E. coli that has a little whip on the end of it, it can actually start there at the urethra, and we'll talk about how we can prevent um, bacteria from entering the urethra. But you can see that it can climb, and when it starts to climb, it can climb along that continuous membrane. There's nothing really to stop it once it gets going, okay? So that's why it's in, really important for hygiene and different things like that, okay? Um, so defense mechanisms is the uh, complete empty emptying of the bladder uh, to prevent urinary retention. Urinary retention is one of the things um, that can cause a UTI. I would like for you to remember that. Okay, so if we have a patient who's retaining urine, um, they are at a very high risk for urinary tract infection just because the urine is sitting stasis, okay? In other words, it's not moving anywhere. It's just sort of there sitting to be a wonderful growing place for bacteria, okay? Um, 
urethral peristaltic activity. There is a normal amount of peristalsis that um, is happening all the time that's keeping the bacteria from going up. Our bodies are pushing down, pushing down, and the ability to empty our bladder so as the urine comes out, it forces any bacteria that have actually entered the urethra, right, back out, okay? So being able to empty the bladder and to have like kind of a forceful stream, okay? So when you have a forceful stream and you're actually peeing with pressure, I guess we'll call it, right, it's washing anything that could grow out, all right? If everything is just dribbling and you don't get rid of all that um, that was in the bladder, you definitely are at a higher risk. Okay, and we also like to see um, an acidic uh, pH, so less than six. So if we see alkaline, right, urine, you're more at risk for UTI. Uh, most of the bacteria, including E. coli, love an alkaline uh, environment, okay? So um, that's why, and we'll get into it a little bit when we talk about prevention, but one of the things you hear about is cranberry juice, right? It acidifies the urine. So that's its purpose, is to acidify the urine. So any uh, alteration in the defense mechanisms. So not being able to empty the bladder, not having a forceful flow, a decreased peristaltic um, activity, those kinds of things will make a patient um, more at risk. And remember, um, there are medicines, and you guys haven't had pharma, pharma, uh, pharmacology yet, and we're not going to really be talking about pharmacology, but one of the side effects of many medications is uh, urinary retention. Okay, so I'll forewarn you as you get into pharmacology and you get to be juniors and you're out on the floor, many medications that people receive actually cause urinary retention, which can put them at risk for UTI. So when you're looking up your medications, make sure that's one of the things that you review. Okay? Predisposing factors, so those are things patients can't change. Okay? So factors that increase urinary stasis, it just is, is if they have benign prostatic um, hyperplasia. So that means that the prostate is grown big, okay? So what that does is that causes males to retain urine. They don't have a forceful flow, okay? So they kind of dribble a little bit, never able to really get um, all of it out of there. Uh, tumors, which cause kind of some obstructions, Neurogenic bladder, which means it just doesn't function in the correct way. And again, medications. Foreign bodies. Um, so if we put catheters in people, even if we use really good technique, they're still at risk, okay? Because there's a biofilm that builds up around the outside of those catheters. And what that is, is it's like some bacteria start to cling to the catheter and then more bacteria come, more bacteria. So they kind of stack up and they build their way up just like a nice little pyramid. And then they start to enter the bladder and they're using the catheter as a way to enter. So really what we're really um, seeing a lot in the hospitals is that we only use a catheter if they absolutely, absolutely positively have to. And then it usually comes out within 24 hours unless there's a reason to keep it in. And nurses have to monitor every day is there a reason to keep this catheter? Literally, you have to mark it, you have to chart it. Is there a reason to keep this? And you have to rationalize in your head, is there a reason to keep this, okay? Um, because urinary tract infections can cause septus, sepsis, um, and we're not there to hurt people, okay? Any urinary tract infection that patients receive via a urinary catheter, the hospital does not get paid for. Any of that medication, they don't get paid for hospital time, they don't get paid for any of those things, okay? So financially, it's a really big deal, but I think about it personally for these patients, okay? Um, remember, urosepsis is a life-threatening problem. All right, calculi, so anything that obstructs the ureters and causes urinary or uh, the urine to pool or puddle up into the kidneys um, would also cause you to um, have retention and to put you at risk for UTI um, and any other uh, instrumentation. So if a patient goes down 
um, to the OR and they're doing what they call a cysto or cystoscopy. They put in, just like they would for a colonoscopy, they put in a little um, kind of a, a mechanism that has a light on the end of it and they'll just go up the urethra and then they can look around in the bladder and look for problems. Okay, so any instrumentation, catheters, calculi, um, functional disorders, so constipation. Did you know that constipation puts people at risk for urinary tract infection? Yes, indeed. Okay. Other factors, pregnancy. Okay. Remember that's putting pressure on the bladder. I hear lots of typing, so here in the cities, I'm going to wait just a second until it quiets down. Everybody's caught up. How are you doing, Rochester? Good to see you all. Is it raining there? Yeah, it's raining up here, too. Hi, Randy. Everybody tired of it? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So other fab <coughs> factors that contribute are, again, uh, instrumentation of any kind. Um, that can allow bacteria to be present in the opening of the urethra. So would you believe it or not, sexual intercourse can actually put you at risk for a UTI. What is that? So when you have sexual intercourse, actually during that, um, during sex, you can actually force bacteria up into the urethra. So it's really important if you have a patient who's experiencing multiple urinary tract infections that you give the education that it's important after you have sex to get up and pee forcefully afterwards, okay? Complete hygiene, okay? And per this is particularly important for people who are experiencing multiple urinary tract infections. That might be a cause. And so it's really important for you to do a good history. So are you sexually active would be something I would ask before I would provide the education, because if they're not, then that's mute point. But um, for people who are, it is really important. Hospital-acquired UTI accounts for 31 of all nosocomial infections. So what's a nosocomial infection? How about anybody in Rochester we haven't talked to today? Nosocomial. Hospital acquired. Hospital acquired, absolutely. So you may see it mentioned as nosocomial or hospital acquired. Good word to know. Um, again, often causes our E. coli. However, pseudomonas can also, so pseudomonas is one of those bacteria that loves to be wet. Okay, so anywhere dark, warm, wet, pseudomonas, and particularly things um, like uh, any kind of instrumentation, um, and particularly patients who are immune suppressed um, in the ICU, that's why they don't let them bring flowers and plants in, because pseudomonas grows rapidly, like in a mop bucket, or in plants that are being watered, or water that's come out of plants. Um, there's a lot of pseudomonas, that's where it grows. And so pseudomonas can become kind of a rampant deal. True story, my dad lost his leg. He had to have a leg amputated because of pseudomonas that he acquired in the hospital. So it can be a rotten bugger. Um, catheter acquired UTIs, um, again, the biofilm develops on the inner surface of the catheter. So. That's what I said. Remove them as soon as possible. Be vigilant with hand hygiene and aseptic technique. Um, so I would say in my years in the hospital, I have seen multiple cases of what I call dry charting of perineal cares, which is where you're supposed to do it every day. In fact, sometimes it's done multiple shifts. And people who don't want to do it just check the box and say it was done. Let me tell you, if if you participate in that, you are putting someone's life at risk, okay? So don't. I know it's no fun. It's not the funnest thing that you can do. But if you can save somebody's life by simply keeping them clean when they can't, okay, it's super important. It's also super important when you are delegating that to your staff, be it NAs or whatever, that you make sure that they understand the importance, they're doing it correctly, and you're making sure that when you're delegating that, you are still responsible. You're responsible to that patient, and you're responsible to your license. 
okay? So just something I have noticed and I really, really like to drive that home uh, with my students. Oh, another quiz question. In older adults, what are common atypical symptoms of UTI? Oh my gosh, I think we already covered this, but let's do it. All right, it is all of the above, okay? So remember, symptoms are often absent. They can't feel it. Non-localized abdominal discomfort rather than that burning sensation, right? So they feel might feel uncomfortable here, but not, it, like you couldn't say, do you have pain on urination? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, absolutely, right? So it's sort of like wishy-washy. Cognitive impairment possible and probably likely. And fever is less likely. Remember, they don't spike a fever, okay? If they do spike a fever, you can just about bet they're getting septic or they're going to be there close. It, you need to get on it, okay? Uh, symptoms related to either bladder storage or bladder emptying. So bladder storage, we think about urinary frequency. Um, abnormally frequent, more than every two hours, okay? So even though, like for women, I can say for myself, you know, when you, even when you go, you, you feel like you got to go, it's two drops, and it feels like you've just peed razor blades, okay? So um, even though you're not urinating a lot, you feel like you have to urinate, and that's because of that peristalsis. So the irritation within the bladder is making it spasm like crazy, so it makes you feel like you got to go, and you get on the toilet and you just wish like you could just go, like you feel like, man, it feels so good. And like I said, it's two drops and you feel like you've just peed razor blades. So it can be uh, frequent urgency, like you got to go when you got to go. So these are questions that you're going to want to ask a patient. Uh, incontinence, so loss or leak leakage of urine, although I wouldn't say that's the most common symptom, uh, definitely there. Bladder storage, so nocturia. Anybody want to guess what that is? What is that? Anybody here in the cities? Okay. Yeah. Waking up two more times at night. Well, see how you are. I gave you the answer, didn't I? Yes, waking up two or more times at night. So not just means at night. So when you chart, you might see nurses use the NOC. That's nights, okay? Um, so it's nights, night shift or whatever, not curia, okay? So it's not normal even when you're older, okay? Although you might get up if, again, that's one of those things that we would treat probably with no caffeine, right, and no liquids or so after 8 o'clock or so, trying to kind of damp that down. So enuresis is loss of urine during your sleep. So it's kind of an abnormal incontinence. Bladder emptying, again, weak stream, hesitancy. Men will often experience this when they have benign prostate. Um, so that prostate is so large, they can't really get that going. Um, however, I did just have a female patient on Tuesday with my students um, that also had an extreme, extremely hard time with hesitancy. She said sometimes she would sit there an hour. She turned the water on, remember in your book when it talked about strategy, so she'd turn the water on, she'd wet the inside of her leg or rub it. I mean, she did all the kinds of things that she should be doing to kind of get that stream going, and it was really difficult, okay? Don, could I reinforce something? Here? Absolutely. Hey. So Don earlier made a point, and I really want to make sure that it didn't slip by you. She pointed to a slide and said, where it said lower um, in bladder infections have no systemic manifestations. And so sometimes students get mixed up about what systemic and local means. We've just gone over a ton of local manifestations. But sometimes students, they read that slide and say, oh, it's no systemic, so there's no symptoms. But she's really going over the local. And I've just found in the past, sometimes students get systemic and local a little mixed up. So I just really want to emphasize what, re-emphasize what she said earlier. These are, a, a, there's a ton of local uh, manifestations here. 
So anybody, I think that's great, Rainy. Thank you very much. Anybody want to tell me what systemic manifestations would be or symptoms specifically? Can you name a couple? Yeah. Fever. Isabel, fever. Anybody else? More. Yeah. Chills. Chills. Increase in blood pressure, heart rate. Increase in blood pressure, heart rate. So um, we're really thinking about that kind of immune response kind of thing. Okay. So yeah, it's super important to realize there's a difference, and you can look those up, systemic, or just make sure when you're w looking at the slides, systemic isn't symptoms, okay? Yeah. Really? Yes. Well, if it's missing a lot of slides, yes, I can. There's no secrets here. Same with the okay. last PowerPoint, too, yeah. for that. I Go back. No, like no, the, the IBD PowerPoint was missing. Was missing. Okay. Sure, I'll post them both. Thank you. Is that helpful? Okay. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Like I said, I couldn't find the ones that I sent to myself, which I'm sure were the same as yours. These are like ones that I found buried in our files because we had to have class today. Just joking. It was all my fault. Um, <laughs> I'm emptying. Intermittency. So that's the interruption, okay, of urinary system voiding. Now, remember, I think in the book it talked about, um, I'm trying to remember the exact name that it's called. Um, it's where you urinate twice. So you urinate the first time, okay, and uh, you stay there for a couple seconds, and then you try to go again, okay? And that can be really helpful for emptying the bladder, okay? So double voiding. Is it double voiding? I think it is. I think it is. Um, it's on the it's on the the PowerPoint for their study guide, but not on this one. Post void dribbling. So urine loss after completion of voiding. So urinary retention can be a cause, or I mean, it, it can make it happen. Or it can also be a clinical manifestation. So it can be come before or after. And dysuria kind of is all of this stuff. Yeah, Hannah. These are all like for UTI. Yes, everything here is for UTI. Yep. That's why I say it was really nice because really in a UTI you see a lot of things. However, I also want you to make sure that you understand. Oh, sorry, Clara. No, you're good. <laughs> that you all uh, that you also understand continence because there will be questions on the next test for sure on incontinence. So understand incontinence as well. Dysuria is difficulty voiding. So it kind of is all of these things. Yeah, Isabel. Are these manifestations for upper and lower tract infections? Um. Yes, I would say more lower tract than upper tract. Um, upper tract. Probably I would say the primary manifestation is acute pain, okay? And so people generally will seek um, care for that and the systemic, like the fever, uh, chills, those kinds of things, uh, rather than some of this stuff. Good question, though, yeah. So remember dysuria. That can be anything. Difficulty voiding. So here, uh, flank pain is obviously going to be localized. Chills and fever, okay, are systemic. But those would be clinical manifestations with the flank pain, particularly, is kind of making it go, woo, 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 kidneys, flank pain. So you're talking all the way up here, right? I don't know which way to go. Can you guys see that in Rochester? Here versus here on the bladder. Does that make sense? Yeah, clear. So this is now these, like flank pain, chills, fever, is more systemic. Flank pain will be local, right? Because that makes sense. It's flank. Chills and fever are systemic, yes. Okay. And remember, pyelonephritis is another word for kidney infection. They're the same, same thing. So if so when you're doing an assessment, you need to ask, have you had any flank pain? That is huge. Because you're trying to find out differences between upper and lower. Okay? Some people might feel, you know, really severe pain with a lower. 
generally it's super painful, but as, let's see, you have your name tag up. That's great. What is it? Catherine. Catherine. And she has seen somebody with a, a, a bladder or a kidney infection. It's very, it's pretty noticeable on their face as they're writhing around. Any questions? Super. Everybody's good? Moving on. So some of the diagnostic studies that you'll see um, is a urinary, uh, so a UA, and so that's basically just a urine test or a urine assay, okay? And that is basically a dipstick, okay? And the dipstick has little pads on it, and there's chemical reactions that are happening on each one of those pads, okay? And so the chemicals are specific to identify white blood cells, and that will be leukocytes, it usually will say, or leukocyte esterase, okay, which is the actual chemical. RBCs, which would indicate there's blood in the urine, okay, that's also not normal. We you normally might, if we, if we looked at it under the microscope, you might see one or two white blood cells, just because, I mean white blood cells, because they're everywhere. We might even see a random RBC. That would really be nothing. But if you start seeing more than three to five and up of white blood cells and more red blood cells, that's kind of not normal. Shouldn't see any glucose in the urine. So if you see glucose in the urine, um, a lot of times that can mean kidney damage, right? Or it could mean you have a diabetic patient who's got some uh, glucose overflow, and we'll kind of talk about that when we talk about the diabetic patient. Protein, also, you should not have in urine. And generally, that is also kidney damage. So if you see glucose or protein, there's kidney damage, not necessarily just a UTI. That would be more concerning. Nitrates are a very specific kind of bacteria. And there's specific uh, antimicrobials that work really well for bacteria that have nitrates. And bilirubin, you should not see, okay, on a normal uh, dipstick, okay? And that actually is liver damage. So we hope we don't see that for sure, all right? So a dipstick that they often do in the office or that they might do at like a minute clinic or whatever can give you like a quick... A quick overview of what's happening um, in the uh, urinary tract. So if they see presence of white blood cells, RBCs, nitrates, bacteria itself, okay, if, no, you wouldn't see that on just the dipstick. After they do what's called a dipstick, then they can send it for an actual analysis where they'll spin it in a machine and it actually intensifies or condenses what's all been in that tube and you can actually look at it under a microscope then and look for other kinds of things like an overgrowth of bacteria um, that's not got nitrates in it or other things okay so a lot of times what they'll do is they'll have this UA where they look at the dipstick if the dipstick is positive they automatically look at it under a microscope but all they have to order is a UA okay now if it's positive, they can put in an order for a culture to be done if it's positive automatically, or if they don't do that, it will go back to the doctor and the doctor automatically then will order one, okay? But what the culture does that's different than the dipstick, so the culture is actually identifying the specific bacteria because we're gonna run it through another machine and we're gonna put it uh, in contact with lots of different antimicrobials and find out which one actually works. So Bactrim would be one of them that it's exposed to, so it would be able to, if, especially if it was E. coli, right? So it would say E. coli, and if we would put it with Bactrim, it would either say resistant or sensitive. So when you're out on the floor as juniors, make sure that you look at those UAs and cultures and kind of get a feel for what's happening, okay? Um, so it identifies the pathogenic organisms it's obtained by a clean catch or catheterization. Never, ever, 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 hear me, ever take urine out of a urine bag for either a UA or a culture. 
pretend I'm God speaking, don't do it. Okay? What's happened is that urine's been in the bag. There probably are a few bacteria running around in the bag, and it's just multiplying, right? It's also gaining alkalinity, so the alkalinity is changing. Everything in that bag is growing and changing. It is not a true reflection of what's going on actually in the body, okay? Um, so there are ways to get um, urine from a, a, a Foley catheter or something else or even a straight cath is the best way to do uh, urine culture, but we can do them from clean catch. But you need to really educate your patients about how important it is to spread the labia, make sure that they clean both sides, that they clean the middle, do that twice, and men to clean the head of the penis appropriately. So you get the best sample because you don't want to test stuff and send it through all these mechanisms and uh, you know send it to the machines that are identifying all this stuff if there's nothing there. Right? So you're basically treating normal flora. Yep. And so if it is like contaminated and mm -hmm. you don't clean it enough, does it show up on the test as normal or like void or how does... Okay, so you need to let the laboratory know what kind of catch it is first. So if you do a clean catch or a Foley, okay, those should be sterile. So if there's anything growing around in there, they're more suspicious. If you do a clean catch and you have epithelial cells, which would come from the sides of the labia or right around the urethra, they're just skin cells. Epithelial cells are just skin cells. So if you had a whole bunch of those and you had a few skin cells like staph, epidermidis, and it just, when you, when you plated it, it was just a bunch of garbage, you would send it back to the floor and be like, contaminated. We, we won't run it through these machines. Okay. So that also takes two days to get it, plate it, and grow it. So you've wasted two days of the patient's time plus money. Okay? So it's super important to do that good education about how to actually collect one. You also want them to pee and collect it about midstream because remember that flushing? It takes everything that's in the urethra and starts to push it out. So you want to catch it midstream. So it's super important to tell them why, financially, especially if they're self-pay, and time-wise. If you have a urinary tract infection and they put you on Bactrim and three days from now they find out you had a contaminated thing, they have no idea what's going to be a really good medication for you to use. We've got to start all over. Hey, by the way, can you pee again? We'll get a culture and send it out. It, it's super tough. Okay, so a lot of that can be um, minimized with good education. So sensitivity just means that the bacteria is sensitive or susceptible to antibiotics. So don't get confused. Resistant means it won't, that bacteria is not susceptible, or the antimicrobial won't work on that kind of bacteria. Okay, make sense? Assessment, so obviously a history. Um, we want to know how often do you normally, you know, urinate because, you know, if you urinate really often it, and then all of a sudden you're coming and saying you're urinating often, what is regularly often and what's more often than often, right? Does that make sense? Um, other symptoms, so we want to know, do you have flank pain or is this pain right here, okay? Do you have pain on urination, right? Uh, if an older person comes in with their daughter, has your, you know, have you felt more that she's been more confused or you're bringing in someone with dementia? Have they fallen recently? Are they eating? Okay, so we really need to do a good assessment. Um, physical assessment. So one of the things, you know, you can do is um, uh, you can look at the patient's body and kind of see what kind of shape they're in. Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of other physical things that you can look at. Um, assess the characteristics of the urine. So when it's collected, did it, does it stink? How, what color is it? Is it yellow or is it gold? Okay. This is normal pee. This is very concentrated pee. And this pee, remember this is see-through, that's really, really diluted. So this is a person that's peeing two drops. Drop, drop. It never concentrates. This is a person who hasn't peed for a whole nursing shift, 12-hour shift. This is what nurses look like, people. Okay? This is how we should look. This is how we really look. Yeah, Xavier. 
water up here. Exactly. When you drain a lot of water, it's going to be more clear. Okay, so we call that diluted. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, you say like, Oh, if a person like um, like goes just two drops. Yeah. So remember we talked about uh, women always having to feel like they need to urinate, but when you go, there isn't much there. So that need to feel like you need to urinate, you're never concentrating urine. Okay. So it's uh, it's usually going to be very clear. It's, so you don't have to look like this for it to be bad. Is what I'm saying. And sometimes you'll even see frank blood in it, which it just means that your urinary tract infection is getting worse. Did I answer your question, Xavier? I feel like I didn't. I was just asking, because like, if you drink like a gallon of water a day, yep. you're just going to have a, a full stream of just like clear. It's going to be clear, yep. and you can have a full stream of clear if you drink yes. lots of water. Yes. There you go. I'm sorry. I made it more complicated, didn't I? How about in Rochester? Have I complicated things to the max for you guys, too? Okay. Um, so if the patient is seeking care, obviously the perception of urinary problems is there, but what is it? You know, what do they think is wrong? How are they feeling like it's different? And then those laboratory and diagnostic tests. If there's any nausea, vomiting, anorexia, chills, nocturia, uh, nocturia frequency, urgency. So think about that top row. Nausea, vomiting, anorexia, chills, those are all systemic. So suprapubic, which is right above the pubic bone, that's why I keep reaching here, that's where the bladder sits, okay? Or lower back pain are local kinds of things. Remember, one is indicative of one and one is indicative of the other. Bladder spasms is what's causing that pain. Dysuria, difficulty bleeding, or bleeding, difficulty urinating. Burning on sensation, so it can feel like razor blades burning. Um, those kinds of things, not normal. So objective data, again, fever, hematuria, so that's blood in the urine. Urine should not be foul smelling. It might smell very concentrated if it's like this, like just strong. But if it really smells bad, um, that's not normal. Um, leukocytosis, again, is whites, too many white cells or an increased number of white cells, leuco white. Positive findings for bacteria, WBCs. Uh, not very often will patients need to do like an ultrasound, CT, or IVP. That would be for our repeat customers because something obviously is wrong. Maybe it's an anatomical problem. So which bacteria is most likely to be the cause of a UTI? Nice job. Um, nursing diagnosis HMC common is impaired urinary elimination and readiness for enhanced self-health management. The, in this particular problem, I would say that nursing uh, education is like top, top priority. Because you can help them prevent future ones. You can also help them take care of themselves right now if they are... Um, you know, uh, needing to, they're just starting to take uh, their antibiotics. Um, I would say prevention is probably the biggest deal. This is just planning. So recognize who's at risk. And I'll post these so don't feel like you need to type it all either. But immunosuppressive drugs or steroids, both are bad. Making people, they're good drugs. They may just make people susceptible. Um, health promotion, so emptying the bladder regularly and completely. This is for us nurses as well. We could do some health promotion in this area. Um, evacuating the bowel regularly, so constipation is not good. Um, wiping the perianal area from the front to the back. Drinking adequate amount of fluids. 
Cranberry juice or cranberry tablets can reduce the number of UTIs, and it's because of the acidification of the urine. Avoiding un unnecessary catheterization and removal of indwelling catheters is huge. Aseptic technique must be followed during any instrumentation and also, um, yeah, so if you're uh, using a, putting in a Foley catheter or a uh, straight catheter, make sure you're washing hands, wearing gloves. Here's where we talk about routine and thorough perineal care for all hospitalized patients. And again, not the most glamorous, but one of the most um, profound things that you can do for patients. Avoid incontinent episodes by answering call lights and offering the bedpan at frequent intervals. Don't make people wait to use the restroom. Um, and in fact, many of our older patients can't wait, okay? Um, also, don't leave them stranded in the bathroom on the toilet for 25 minutes because the risk for falling um, or just getting totally agitated um, and unruly is there. And you know what? If someone left me in the bathroom and I was unable to move myself and I was in there for 25 minutes, I'd be a little unruly myself. So can't blame them. Acute intervention, so making sure patients um, have adequate fluid. Now, they may not want to do it because it hurts to go, um, but we really need to have them do it. It dilutes the urine, makes it more clear, making the bladder less irritable. Bladders are more irritable when they're this color, okay? Um, and again, it flushes out the bacteria before they can colonize. Okay, so this is hugely important. I might even say very important. So this is more nursing education, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, Although you would think citrus juices would actually acidify urine, it does not. There's a lot of glucose in there, so it's really not good. And a lot of calories. Um, chocolate and highly spiced foods. They can be potential bladder irritants. Um, applica or application of local heat uh, does, and even back here on the back, can uh, offer some relief. Make sure that you talk to patients about drug therapy. Any antimicrobial microbial therapy will cause systematic death of normal flora in the gut, so they should really think about eating yogurt or taking a probiotic or something like that to recolonize the gut with appropriate kinds of flora, okay? Um, also, that will help reduce the um, opportunity for yeast to grow, which often grows after antibiotic therapy. Um, also, for some antimicrobials, uh, they need to be taken either with food or not with food. Um, so you want to make sure that you pay attention to those kinds of things. Uh, make sure that your patient understands that. Um, absolutely positively emphasize the importance of taking the full course of antibiotics so they start to feel well after day two, so they quit, or three, and they quit, and it's a five-day course. Or after four days, they feel really good, and it's a 10-day course. And you know, I should really save some of these in case I get another infection, and then I'll just have them in the cupboard, right? No. So what can happen is that bacteria either will come right back in a, like, rage, or that's what helps build that resistance, okay? So then the next time that um, bacteria has an, uh, had an opportunity to readjust itself and become resistant to that microbial. Um, do, 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 do. Monitor for signs of improvement. Make sure they let the doctor know if they're not because they may be on the wrong antibiotic. Um, counsel on para, uh Persistence of lower tract symptoms beyond treatment, so they should be reported immediately. So these are those people who have maybe something actually the matter anatomically or whatever. Um, maintaining adequate fluids, um, regular voiding, and remember to void after intercourse. So this is just what we hope that they will experience is normal urinary elimination relief of symptoms, and verbalize knowledge of treatment regimen. Um, can also use some non-analgesic uh, relief measures. 
So if you have a patient with um, that's elderly, we really recommend Tylenol over NSAIDs, um, but NSAIDs would be appropriate for people your age for sure. Um, we really want them to pass urine without urgency, be free of blood. Um, and this might be the last one here. The nurse identifies that the patient will, with the greatest risk of urinary tract infection is, so this one's a little tougher. a wide variety so it's deep a 72 year old woman remember age is one of those things that kind of can put them at risk she's had a stroke so she has some neurological problems um, she also has a urinary catheter I would say star urinary catheter that's really the big one here okay so a lot of the rest of that in that particular sentence are distractors I know we distract you right Okay, so we're done with that. However, I have a little wee fun. We're going to do a case study and then go over the answers. So, you want to take half? Three, So before I turn the microphone off, so begin to work on those in your groups. Uh, let's try to be done about like 12 or 13, 14 after so we can go through um, uh, the answers before our class is over. And I'll see you then. Rainy, did you remember to print ICA things there in the Rochester? Thank you, Rainey. I have a question here in Rochester. What do you want on the ICA? Um, why don't you put uh, one major thing that you learned about um, uh, bowel elimination and one thing you learned about bladder elimination and it doesn't have to be about a UTI or IBD it could be something from the study guide or the voice thread um, but I'd like for you to be thoughtful and actually write like a couple of sentences um, some of the ICAs I had last week basically had two words so let's let's be a little more thoughtful
just a couple more minutes, you guys, so. Okay, I want to have time to talk about the answers for the questions because I think that's important. Um, Rainy, I do not have the new seating chart for those nice folks in Rochester, and I can't see all of their name tags, so you can help me out when I holler at Rochester to find a wonderful soul who I know would love to answer all my questions. Oh, that sounds great. I knew you would be excited about that. Yes, you would. Okay, so like I said um, already, when we go through a case study, it's super important to start. It's super important to pick out important things from the actual um, narrative. And so I'm going to, yeah, we can go through it. So do you think that she's 55 is important information? Yes, it I think it's like, as we read further, it might be important. So she's had problems with stress incontinence for the past, fat, ooh, Don, right? the past two years. There she goes. She has not spoken to anyone about her problem because she's embarrassed. Do you think that's important? Yeah. So that kind of gives you an idea of, mm, I'm going to have to maybe think about doing some education, you know, using therapeutic communication, building a relationship, those kinds of things. Um, but she finally does confide in her health care provider. And honest you, honestly, sometimes it's the nurse that they'll talk to. 
and then you're like, yeah, that's really not normal. You know, and there are things that we can do. And so it's the nurse's encouragement that actually gets them to confide in the caregiver. Um, it's caused her social uh, problems. Um, and she actually is ready, readiness for enhanced, right? So she's ready to regain urinary control. So that's good. Um, she weighs 200 and her height is 5'1". Do you think that's important? Yes. Yeah. So another thing with the age, so if we, and we don't have that information, so in questions I would like to ask her is, how many pregnancies have you had, had right? right. Um, did you have any trouble? Did you have multiple births? Um, because a lot of times um, what happens after that is that you do develop some stress incontinence and you really do have to do some extra things to build back up those muscles, okay? So about 55, especially if you're overweight, is kind of when you start to develop those symptoms and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm still pretty young. I don't want to talk about that. You know, it's like this is an older person issue, incontinence, and you're just kind of embarrassed and you don't want to talk about it. So age is important in that this is about when it shows up and I would want more information because just being 55, eh, that's really neither here nor there. So I think you're right. Um, she's been referred to a continence specialist and a plan of care was developed. So um, let's see, she's recently begun Kegels to attempt to improve urinary control. Um, she doesn't see any improvement. What additional teaching does Miss Grayson need? Rainey, you want to pick a nice person there in Rochester to kick it off? Well, Aaron and Nick look really nice here. Why don't you guys talk All right. Okay. Um, so a few things that we could educate her about would be to, um, like, probably lose some weight, um, avoid lifting heavy things because um, that can reduce the inner abdominal pressure. Um, some other things we said, just reducing caffeine intake, um, having like a regular toileting schedule. Anything okay. else? Yeah, and so double voiding is that thing we talked about before. So making sure that you get rid of all that urine on there. Um, and really those caffeinated beverages can really be a bugger. Okay? So uh, two months after your first encounter, she's been seen by her primary hair care oh gosh health care provider if I slow down um, for burning on urination which you know and that in with uh, increased frequency and urgency is a sign of what somebody in the cities UTI. UTI what kind upper lower 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 perfect perfect okay um, and she's also noted blood in her urine for a week um, so someone else here in the cities, what's Mrs. Grayson experience and what do you want to teach her to minimize her symptoms is the part of this I'd like you to address. So let's see, why don't we do, um, this table over here. Yeah, a couple of you guys. We gotta hurry to get through all the answers. We said that she could drink water and cranberry juice and like just intaking more liquids would help her. Super. So, I mean, really there's not a whole lot of crazy stuff other than what we've already talked about. So good perineal hygiene, wiping front to back, making sure that she empties her, empties her bladder completely, um, that she can take some cranberry juice to, to decrease that alkalinity. Super. Okay. So the next one is, she says she's not satisfied with her current state of urinary control and she's decided on a more permanent solution. Um, and she opts for a minimally invasive procedure that will help support the urethra. She's going to be going home in the Welling catheter. She asks you how she's going to care for it at home. So what are you going to tell her and what would you tell her about measures to remain infection free? Someone in Rochester. Dayton and Brian, what do you guys think? Uh, so for this we said proper proper cleaning of the catheter and then report any abnormal findings to her health provider and then possibly go in for checkups in the meantime while she has it. Super. A couple other things we want to remember about um, catheter stuff is making sure that we don't get the catheter bag up above where we have the insertion site. Um, that can cause some of the bacteria or stuff that's been in the bag to actually kind of flow back into the bladder. So we want to make sure, and sometimes that can just happen like people walking around or whatever, so they really need to know kind of how to manage that. 
Most people going home would have a light bag, though, so unless they were laying upright, but you should always let them know. Um, again, adequate fluid intake, so I think that's been in three different parts of this. You can tell how important it is. Um, yeah, Prevent, preventing kinks is another big deal. If a kink happens in the urinary catheter, what can happen is that urine will black back up, up into the kidneys, and not just if she's had an infection be a big deal, um, but you can get um, hydronephrosis, which will actually damage permanently the kidneys. So, bad, bad deal. Okay, let's hit a couple of these down here. So, we have Javier is the home health nurse visiting Larry. Um, he's become nauseous, bloated, and has abdominal pain. He took some laxatives. He woke up with severe abdominal pain. Noticed that his belly was larger than normal, hard, painful. Um, once he was in the bathroom, he began to vomit. Um, his mother heard him and had to race to his side, finding him unconscious. So that's a big deal. She called for an ambulance. That was a good decision. So um, now Larry arrives in the ED with vomiting and severe abdominal pain. What nursing assessment questions does the nurse ask? Um, let's see here. Here in the cities, let's do this table. Um, we were talking about like when was his last bowel movement and like how long his symptoms have been going on. Okay. And like any interventions he's used and like if they have helped him or not. Okay. So assess bowel elimination patterns. So that's good. How often do you go? When was the last time that you go? Um, specific things. Uh, when did the nausea start? Vomiting start? Is it related to anything? This is super important. How does it look? Um, a specific kind of emesis that looks like coffee grounds is very indicative um, for a bleeding stomach ulcer, which is very can be very dangerous. Um, you know, is he seeing undigested food in there? That might be a really um, unique finding of a bowel obstruction when they start, I hate to say it, but vomiting stool, um, which is very horrible, but um, that's, that's, a, that's a sign of that. Other symptoms, so dizziness, headaches, abdominal pain. So all of that, it, and I think that comes straight from your book, is super important. The nurse received an order to put in an NG tube, which is absolutely wonderful. Once the NG is in place, how does the nurse determine if it's in the stomach? Oh, I'll let you guys see. Rochester. Stacy and Maggie. I believe it's through an x-ray. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and what additional tests do you anticipate? So we could have um, x-rays. We could also have, um, I think probably x-rays. They might do an ultrasound. They could go for CT. Um, but anyway, I think you guys have done an excellent job. Please make sure you hand in your ICAs. Make sure you've answered your two questions. Make sure your names are on them. And we will see you next week for a fun game for 3 to 1. Bye.